at the uh, all right we're live okay yeah um before we start i would like to know if the folks in the fire room fireside room could introduce themselves i know frank is there but i can't see who else is there yeah so uh I was briefly introduced at the beginning. I'm Luca Bella. I just finished my master's degree from Eastern University, from the Templeton Honors College. Uh, I've been here a few times, uh, hoping to make it more of a routine in my schedule uh, moving forward. Thank you. Lee Vogel, Liz, I'm part of the tool belt. Yes, team. Lee. Hello. I, I can't see you, but I can hear you. Thank you. Well, Liz, I'm Dave Lighty. I'm one of the holes in the belt of the tool belt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dave. <laughs> Hi, Liz. Doug McBrarity. Hey, How Doug. Hi, Liz. I'm Tim Pretz. I, uh, along with Sal and Frank, help organize this. And then um, I bring something to eat and then spend the morning trying to eat everything I can so I don't have to take much home. <laughs> um, Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, my plan for this morning is very, very simple. Um, I wanted to this time to be a time for you guys to ask questions, to learn about me. And then I have maybe two questions for you. And so I'll let you go first and ask away. I just reserve the right to say, mm, maybe not. <laughs> So Liz, I'll, I'll start off. I would, I, I'd love to hear just um, a brief highlight of um, your faith journey. Okay. How did you come to Christ and, and your calling into ministry? Okay. Um, so I am a cradle Presbyterian. Um, I was ordained an elder my junior year in high school. Oh and um, went to college and of course, started to question things and walked away from the church for a little bit. Um, and then when um, my husband and I were blessed with children, we decided to go back to church and um, I, we went to the Presbyterian church just because I didn't feel comfortable joining Jim in the Catholic tradition. So um, the family became Presbyterian. We were in Charlotte, North Carolina at the time. And so we became active in a church there. And Jim and I are both accountants and we were working there, you know, doing our little accounting thing. And then probably about 15 years into our membership at our church, um, a new program was started with a, it was a twinning relationship with a church in Debrecen, Hungary. Um, Hungary was just coming out of Russian occupation and the church was flexing its muscles and wanting to become a vibrant organization again. And so this church in Debertson um, partnered with our church in Charlotte because they wanted to learn how to do adult education, um, mission, and just become a vibrant church again. And so I had the opportunity to travel to Hungary and meet with folk and um, we were amazed in talking with our Hungarian hosts, the, the struggle that they had to maintain their faith during Russian occupation. For 40 years, the churches were shut except for an hour on Sunday morning. And yet, oh. as soon as the Russians left, the churches were open and wanting to to be revitalized and just it we were just um convicted of 
how we Americans take our ability to worship for granted. And so that was uh, an awakening to me. And then about a year after that, I was diagnosed with cancer, went through cancer treatment protocol for a year, came out of that and began having dreams that something was about to change. And I was going back to, to school and couldn't figure out what I was going to study. And a guest minister came up to me one time while we were getting ready for worship. I was um, an elder assisting with the worship program. And she said, I don't know you, but there is a seminary in town and it's designed for um, working, working folks, um, second career seminarians, and you need to check it out. And so I went home from that retreat, told my husband, and he said, well, it just so happens my Sunday school teacher is one of the professors at that seminary. And three months later, I was enrolled in seminary. Mm -hmm. and so then um, five years after that, took the ordination exam and was called to serve a church in Arkansas as an associate pastor. And after three and a half years, um, went back to Ohio where we were raised and I served as a solo pastor in Hawking County in Logan, Ohio. And then the pandemic hit and we moved to Philadelphia. My husband um, found a job as the business administrator for the uh, Presbytery of Philadelphia. And here we are. Well, and tell the story of how you came to Wayne. You initially came, you know, in a totally different role, which is just, this is great. I love it. Right. So um, I, I was, we moved to, to Philadelphia. So I arrived at the Presbytery of Philadelphia as a traveling spouse. Um, I was not welcome or I did not enter into the Presbytery as a uh, call in a called or installed position. And I saw the posting for the director of finance position on the Presbytery website. And um, it just seemed to fit me like a glove um, because I was a CPA for 30 years. I, and I'm an ordained pastor and I, can relate accounting to the church. And so interviewed and was hired to serve Wayne as the director of finance and absolutely loved it. You guys are a great group of folk. Absolutely. You, you've had a, a brief introduction to our ministry in Southwest Philadelphia. And then you took over, I guess, for a while, or maybe still, as the staff person for the for the faith in action mm -hmm. at Wayne. Uh, what are your impressions of that, and how how do you see that remaining as a core uh, activity in our church life? Um, what I saw of the the missions missions in Southwest Philadelphia um, just totally amazed me. Um, they are vibrant missions um, and I am just amazed and that, that you have done that work. Of course, you've done it with God's help and um, the help of the neighborhood and I, I just think they're phenomenal. They're beautiful missions. Um, my, my wondering um, going forward is 
are they ready to be are they ready to be launched um and are can they become more of a um partner that stands beside us as we move into other areas and that's just a question that as a staff person supporting the faith in action group at Wayne that I can ask it is ultimately my, not my decision that is a decision of of the church of the faith in action committee um, that we make with um, discernment and and prayer um, but I think it's it's a valid question because they are beautiful um, entities, beautiful, um, the cornerstone, the, the school, the orchestra, um, what is happening at Mitchell, they're all, Mitchell School, they're all wonderful, vibrant um, partnerships. And do they need our support as much as they did, you know, 10, 15 years ago. I build on that and ask you how much you think we might need their support. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, what we found, what the twinning committee found in dealing with, with um, Hungary, that, um, Yes, we had a lot of information that we could share with them about how to build an adult education program, how to build a, a homeless shelter, but my goodness, did they teach us about um, developing a personal relationship um, with, with prayer and scripture reading and not be solely reliant on activities at the church. Um, we learned so much from them, so much more than I felt we, we taught them. Liz, that's good to hear because uh, I joined Wayne Presbyterian Church under John Galloway Sr. And uh, COVID has brought me back into the fold, but I met a Hungarian underground evangelist by the name of Don O'Don when uh, I was in high school at Wayne. And it's not a worship service unless the pastor speaks for at least two hours, <laughs> they said under communist rule. But uh, the, uh, uh, the punishment that the communist governments gave fostered church growth. And the question here, I think, as you alluded to is, uh, you know, with all our freedoms, are we growing? Because that persecution helps us to grow. I'm excited to hear that about you. I just have to say something that Wayne has been active locally for a long time. 25 plus years, we've been hosting homeless families in the church. Uh, four or five times a year, it requires some 50 volunteers to, uh, to have that week happen. Um, and um, it has, in some ways it's been invisible because uh, many, many people that come into the church on Sunday morning aren't even aware that the, that the, the folks have been sleeping there that night and eating dinner that night. And um, we've also, uh, our church has established local missions outside the church uh, as well. Uh, Baker Industries was started by a couple in our church, and they're a thriving uh, workforce development uh, mission. Um, the um, uh, uh, mission to Chinese seamen is 55 years, was started by a couple in our church. It's still going. Um, and, and there are others, but... Um, one of the biggest things that went on, although I call it the mini TCP, was when we restored the the community, the only remaining uh, African American owned community center in in Radnor, the RTCA, uh, was a multi church effort. A lot of the stuff that we've been doing in the last few years has been multi church efforts. Um, so um, I think our faith in action program has been 
more than just Southwest Philadelphia. Uh, Southwest Philadelphia, the way Casey said, it was like walking to the edge of the cliff and jumping off and having faith that we'll have a safe landing. And and we not only had a safe landing, we had a we had a cushion landing. But it, it, it's a fantastic story. It's got national attention. Uh, some of the other local things that we do don't quite measure up to that, but but they're no less significant. Absolutely, absolutely. Just a, a reminder of that. Uh, this October will be 10 year, 10 year anniversary of acquiring wow. the common place. Wow. Pretty unbelievable. 10 years. Yeah. <clears throat> Liz, you said you had some questions for us. Well, my first question is, um, how do you define or what would you expect for pastoral care? Um, I have I have served a church where the pastor was really, really involved with um, dare I say, assisting in medical um, medical visits, hospital visits, you know, very, very involved. And then I've assisted a congregation where it was hands off. And so what is the expectation for pastoral care in Wayne? What would you like to see? What would you want changed? You know, what, what are your expectations? Well, Lizzie, you raise a good point because I think that the congregation has to decide what the congregation wants to do. Mm -hmm. And then they have to bring that to your attention. But what is the venue by which that can be done? I don't think it's through session. I think it's through congregational meetings and sitting down and say, okay, congregation, what do you want this church to be? And I don't know if that venue has been created yet. I think that may be in the process, but that's a good, that's a good question. Um, yeah, just, just an observation. Mm -hmm. um, this church has a lot of unstated expectations that are used to judge pastors. Oh, man. Um, and that what, what Lee is talking about is getting those unstated expectations on the table because mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, uh, inappropriate to judge people by a criteria that they are not aware of. Mm -hmm. That's right. So one of the things that the Centers for Healthy Churches folks kind of came to a fairly quick conclusion on they noted that on the PCUSA website for the last five years, our stated membership is 20, 2,268 members. And, and that number has been static for five years. <laughs> and um, um, they asked a few questions wow. about weekly worship attendance and, and a variety of other things and uh, using rules of thumb that, that they use said we're probably more likely to be a 700 to 1,000 person uh, membership church. And so one of the things that, that breeds some underlying tension in the congregation is that we have the expectations of a 2,200 person church, but we aren't a 2,200 person church. We are a, probably more likely to be a 750 uh, person church. So, mm -hmm. you know, one of the first jobs of of, 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 of leadership is to uh, not only lay out a vision, but, but certainly to manage expectations, uh, to provide realistic expectations about what's, cap what's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to learn how to act our size. Um, I, think, I think we need to know what our size is and be realistic about it. Once. Right. Yeah. right. And one of the things, that's not an easy job. When Mary Jo was working there, they tried to call the list. People got letters and they said, what do you mean I'm not on the list? And they haven't been in the church in years. So, you know, it's easy to talk about, but not easy to do. Yeah. So one of the things that session decided the other night is to put together a task force 
uh, to develop a census for Wayne Prez. Uh, the deacons have already gone through the list for uh, folks 70 and older. Um, we want to figure out how to work together with the deacons uh, and this task force and stewardship so that we could get a fix on A, membership, B, worship attendance accurately measured, and then C, uh, you know, giving what's known in the business, I guess, as giving units. But you know, we're working together with stewardship to figure out who's not only who's coming to church or who thinks they're a member, but then also who's who's writing a check. And those three mm -hmm. measures are apparently like the foundation of 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 um, you know of, ma of making decisions going forward, uh, because that that has to be the realistic assessment of who we are, uh, taking a snapshot of who we are right now. Right. Right. Yeah. As a, as a recipient of, of pastoral care, rather than being a giver of pastoral care in the past, mm -hmm. um, I, I certainly second the idea that, that the, it, not only the clergy, but the, but the deacons, and we've had very, very faithful deacons uh, visiting us and caring for us, uh, and that's made a huge difference in our our uh, Christian life, and our um, our relationship with the church. And I think um, that first of all, committees that that deal with with membership have to establish personal relationships, and the the the, the three pastors can't do it by themselves by any means. And we might want to look at, at reviving Stephen ministry again mm -hmm. and focusing the, all of the work of the deacons on, on visitation. I, I, I would echo that when we're talking about membership lists and giving unit lists, those are all important. I want to see whether it's a formal list or informal, that, that the list of people, the number of people who are involved in pastoral care grows. Um, when, when I have taught classes in that, I've made a point, if it just is for the pastors to do pastoral care, it's gonna be good but limited because we only have a certain number of pastors. Change mm -hmm. that P from a capital P to a lowercase P and uh, encourage, exhort, challenge the members of the congregation to be involved in visitation and hospitals and all the Stevens ministries and those things. Um, when, when we develop um, that sense of pastoral care being our responsibility, we'll really see things take off. Uh, this is philosophical, but the, the, con the church culture mirrors the country's culture in that we have a, uh, a delegate first mindset and delegate, you know, write a check or delegate the pastors to do and there's not a do it mindset. Um, and that, uh, it's one of the things that the blue belt guys do is you get in and you do stuff. Uh, but uh, when I joined the church in the 90s, there was, it was very active and that um, membership meant you did something up more than just come to worship. Uh, and I think we need to get back to that. And, and while people respond to a specific need, Okay. Back back when we were doing a great deal internationally, remember it was if you told them that you needed an operating room light in the field hospital in Kenya, you got donations like crazy. But bread for the world, just a general theoretical situation, and the response was was good, but not the same. You'd find individuals that will stand up for individual needs and specific actions. And I think the I think Ted's point of the relationship piece is, is, is very important. When we were considered to be a large church, it seemed like it was just a, a, a given that now pastoral duties had to be segmented. You had a preacher who concentrated on preaching. You had someone who held responsibilities for discipleship because there were so many to look after and pastoral care was divided out. If we're a smaller church, somehow developing the relationships, I think per personal relationship, a, a preacher who interacts with the, with the congregation, which we, I don't think we've had a strong sense of that for quite some time. 
quite some time here. Okay. So what I'm hearing then is that, that one of my first tasks would be to interact more closely with the, the deacons and get to know them, support them, and find out how we can, with the deacons, engage the congregation in taking care of the congregation. Is that, is that a fair assessment? No. I think, I think you need to engage the congregation. I think the deacons do the work. It's that the congregation has to start doing some of the work. Right. And they, right. Have, to, they, and, and, and they have to feel that they're part of something. And I think there's a lot of things that happen in the church that people don't know about. I think the women, if we should follow the lead of the women's groups. They seem to get things done. They can have a, a, a breakfast where 75 women will show up. <laughs> you, you have 10 people sitting here for the men. But the women know how to do it. And I think we need to start listening to some of the things that they do that, that seems to work. Well, right. I also think we, we really did ourselves a disservice in how uh, we eliminated a lot of the uh, administrative staff in the office. You know, I hear the complaint that we don't have volunteers, that there, you know, people aren't volunteering. Well, those volunteers' relationships at the church were not with ministers, but were with the administrative staff, with the people who work in the office. And when you break that connection, I think it's really hurt a lot of our, um, you know, a lot of our engagement in our church. I would build on what Lee says. Yes, help the deacons to feel more equipped and involved, but it's got to go beyond the deacons. So whether it's mm -hmm. um, deacons make a, a commitment to make one or two uh, pastoral care calls a month and they bring one or two church members along with them or um, I don't know how this works in a church of our size, but when a uh, need comes up, uh, even on Sunday morning, we take a few minutes and say, uh, who knows Sally Jones or Bill Smith, and we'll be willing to go and contact them and um, you know, update the pastoral staff how they're doing. It's something that's got to move beyond just the designated people. It's got to become congregational. Why? Yeah. Right. So Joe the Vandeveer was a great example of that. My dad uh, spent his uh, his last years at Dunwoody and Joe Vandeveer moved into Dunwoody with his wife. And, uh, uh, you know, he's not a deacon. He wasn't a Stephen minister or anything. He was, he's kind of just adopted my dad, <laughs> you know, and he'd, he'd go over and they'd read the Bible together and talk together. And it was just, uh, it, it was a very much a pastoral care uh, situation and it was it was lovely to see it unfold. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an example of an individual mm -hmm. leaning into our faith. Mm -hmm. It was so. Uh, I think it was I obvious think we, and moving. We have we can probably come up with a list of people who are still members of the church who were once ordained as an elder or as a deacon, mm -hmm. who are not actively on a board right now. But that group of people could be appealed to, to be activated in the sense that we're talking about of helping out with pastoral care. Um, you know, yes, accompanying the deacons or accompanying a pastor, uh, so they they get a sense of a of a good way to do it, maybe. And and uh, but I have a feeling that that most of those folks, of which I'm one, uh, could. Uh, already have a sense of uh how to be pastoral um you know and i i think that's a that's a resource that is that is lying dormant um and um and i and i heard that in the in the presentation uh on tuesday that that um you don't have to have uh ordination is only required for for Ministers of the Word and Sacrament and moderating a, a session meeting. Uh, right. There are a lot of functions that that uh, congregational members and elders can do um, without having to be ordained. So maybe this is a resource that is is uh, actually a larger resource, and we're just forgotten about it. And and a little bit of uh, uh, inspired leadership could get could get those folks active again. There are there are there. It's not that no one does it. There are people that do it. The women, as Lee said, for sure. Um, but there are there are some men who who do it. But 
Um, I think as a group, there's a resource there that could be stronger. Okay, so it's more resource. So what I'm hearing is you would view my role as past in pastoral care is more of resource development rather than um, hitting the streets eight hours a day, yeah, three yeah. days a week. You, you can't do it all. There's too many. There's too right. many. We have a fairly large population of elderly people who are seeking comfort and you just don't have, uh, you're, you're a super pastor, but you're still not enough. Liz, Liz, don't don't give us a fish. Teach us how to fish. <laughs> okay, okay. Good for you, Sal. Uh, okay, Liz, yeah. Liz. You know the good the good news here is that you you come into an area that is very historic, and so the Tennant brothers and their father, we uh, all of us had ancestors that went back to all the tenants, and and it's in your congregation. And I'm gonna, I intend to talk to the tenants when I get up there. So if the tenants think that's Gilbert and the other guys, I can't even remember, I get Mathers and, and tenants confused. But I'm gonna see the, that log church group. And we all have ancestors that go back there. And so, you know, uh, my suggestion for you is, you know, you beautiful accountant, you uh, do what you do and do it, do it, with full aggression, do it with full and your lovely, lovely person that you are, do it in your full aggression. That's my suggestion. There's another thing I think yeah. the church needs to do a little better job in messaging when people leave the church. I think with Tim's departure and now Austin's departure, by just sending out an email that he resigned. Well, why did he resign? Did he resign because they weren't gonna be able to pay him because we don't have the money? And why did Tim leave? And people see that as, wow, are we crumbling? There's really not been a lot of transparency as to why people leave. I think people leave because maybe there's better jobs out there. It's career development. And I understand all that. But a lot of people just take that as seeing, wow, there's another loss of the church. Why should I go? We're not going to have music programs like we had before. Or we're now we have no youth program. Who's going to take over that? What, when uh, did think, Austin resign? I'm sorry, Lee. Uh, there was something that came out last week that he resigned. Oh, man. Oh, PhD. So again, if for all the right reasons for Austin, but it just made the church maybe, why did we lose Austin? Well, I, I, I thought, and maybe it's because I know the backstory, I thought that Austin's leaving was, was explained. Um, he came to, to Wayne in a mode of discernment to discern whether or not he was called to ministry. And while he was at Wayne, he, he felt a stronger call to serve in academia. And so that is, that is why he's leaving. He found a post at Eastern and um, he, is, he is moving into this, the spot that he feels God is calling him to be. And I, I think that's something that we can celebrate. Um, and I, I, I thought that that was communicated in the letter. I will go back and read that. Because he was here three weeks ago with no, none of us thinking that, that we we're going to get an email a week later that he's leaving. Right. And we weren't left with that impression at all. Right. I, think not, professionally, I think professionally it would have been very inappropriate. For him of course, Sal, but you have to message that, yeah. it. You have to message it in a way that he's going on to do something better. We salute him, and that's great. But it just seems to me, what do we do about the youth program now? Who's going to take over that? And Sal and I had a discussion a couple of months ago, and we both agreed that that old three-legged stool uh, of Wayne was preaching, music, and the youth program, and the music in the youth program is why I'm back again, because that was a very important part of my uh, high school days. But you know, the preaching is good. We don't have a senior pastor. or mm -hmm. You don't have a senior pastor. Your music director left with two weeks mm -hmm. notice. And now Austin is leaving. All perfectly good reasons 
but it seems like the stool is wobbling with only one leg left. So do you own it? Do you say, hey, you know, this is why it happened, but it needs to get out there. It needs to be transparent. Well, my frustration is that, I mean, Casey left almost a year ago and we still don't have a mission study or a PNC. I, I just, that's beyond me. I, I don't know how we got to this point. By the way, the, the three-legged stool is worship, education, and mission. Yeah, so the, the stool the is, I responded to. The stool still stands. True, but what you just described is, is done through sermon, worship, music, praising God, and teaching, education the high schoolers, the youth program, because those are going to be the people that become leaders in the church someday. Yeah, but these things are still going on. They haven't stopped. They so haven't. Liz, Liz, you've got about 10 minutes if that's enough time to do your second question. If not... <laughs> as, as, we, as we come out of another important rabbit hole. Um, so my second question is... Um, faith in action and mission and going forward with that. Um, yes, I will. I began working with faith in action last year and I will continue to do that. And so we talked about it a little bit with um, your question about the Southwest Philadelphia project and um, Scott, touched on it with his comment about um, family promise and um, the Radnor Township, what is it, community center? Or Civ well, center? Civic Association, community Civic center. Civic Association, yeah. Um, so what is your view? What would you like to see happen in mission? Because I've only got a few more months to, to be here. Liz, what, what did you mean by that last remark? A few more months to be here. Um, my contract, I'm a bridge associate and my contract is through the end of the year. The end of the, of the, the uh, calendar year or? Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, till, okay that's, till that's a few more months is, is, is 11, not two or three. <laughs> right, right, sorry, sorry, uh, but yeah. Uh, but my my thought was just just listening to the guys here that um, for missions to be uh, successful, it has to be visible. And ah. for for goodness sake, don't let anybody know that I said this. But um, our Southwest Philadelphia mission, as good as it's always been, is much less visible now. We talk mm. about it. But it's, it's difficult for uh, new members and for, for elderly members to be part of that, mm -hmm. of that ministry. And I would second um, um, Scott Laird's commitment to local mission that people can actually see in action. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we used to have Saturdays of service. I mean, they were very effective in getting people engaged in mission because we'd get together and we'd go out and we'd serve. Um, you know, that hasn't happened in a long time. But that, that took a great deal of effort. That took, that took either congregational members or those in the youth program or in mission finding local needs who had activities that, a number of unskilled people could contribute their time to. And, and it took an awful lot of organizational effort to do it. So there's, you need a group of people to accomplish that. Pastors can't do that. Well, but I mean, I love the idea. I was working on, I was working on Saturday uh, days, days of service with um, Rick Davis, the Fellowship of the Bean and Austin Ricketts through the youth. Uh, 
the days of service are good. Uh, they brought intergenerational folks in to do things, um, uh, not only in the church, but also sometimes with our partners. But they tend to be project focused in that, what are we going to get done today? And uh, and we do the project and, and have some fellowship time together. But oftentimes, we don't get to know much about the youth that we're working with, us older folks. And and Daryl Pearson, who has been one of our, our uh, Thursday morning uh, leaders once a year, was uh, has retired as youth minister or, or professor of youth ministry at Eastern. But he was saying that um, why uh, one of the thing a survey that was done that one of the things that kept young people uh, coming back to the church even after they had graduated was that they felt that the church members knew them that they were recognized mm -hmm. and that oftentimes uh, they come into church but if you don't know them and you don't talk to them or find out what's going on in their lives they don't feel as connected to the church as those who did stay and so the idea was how can we make the day of service not just a project to do activities because some people really like that but can we also make one of those activities an opportunity for youth and uh, older members of the church to have a, a conversation, a fellowship of the bean or a fellowship of the Coke uh, and um, uh, without, without the parents of those kids necessarily being in the same meeting so they can feel they can talk freely uh, to, uh, to hear some of the stories and and uh, of the elders, but also for the elders to get to know what's going on in the lives of the young people in our church. Um, and that could actually be a day of service uh, where we aren't polishing uh, handrails or, or uh, making, you know, making things in the kitchen, but we're actually getting to know, increasing the connections between older members of the church and younger youth who are in our church and are, are maybe in a seeking stage. So I, I, I would see that as a mission uh, outreach effort. Uh, if we could figure out how to do that and Austin and Rick were working on that to expand Fellowship of the Bean to consider that. Uh, and Daryl Pearson was kind of the inspiration for that. But, um, uh, and Dar I think we've thought about having Daryl help us uh, organize that, uh, uh, you know, that, that kind of activity with his wisdom of, of for years, he's been leading youth ministry. And uh, so uh, I'd like to see, I'd like to see that because all of us have recognized the difficulty of getting the younger generations uh, in the church more frequently. Well, stay tuned, they're coming and the churches are gonna discover how to get them to come, whether it's a Presbyterian or a Methodist or a Lutheran or an Episcopal, they're going to discover how to do this and stay tuned because it's coming. It's coming to your, it's coming to your neighborhood. You know, it's coming to your, your cinema. Yeah, I hope. So we're getting close to the end. Uh, Liz, if you have any closing comments, please uh, feel free to offer them. And, and then we usually ask the speaker to close us in prayer. Um, so my closing comments are, I would welcome talking with you guys individually or coming again um, to hear more of your comments, more of your recommendations. Um, just call me, send me an email, and we can schedule a time to, to talk. Um, you have much to teach me about Wayne and about what um, you would like me to do. I am your servant, that's what pastors are. So um, please, please call, please talk. I think something to keep in mind here is the stage we're in involves critical thinking, but critiquing doesn't necessarily mean dislike. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. It's important to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is counter cultural again right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. It doesn't necessarily mean division. 
It means you've noticed something. Or else right. here. <laughs> yep. yep. Let's so, have a lot of fun, will you please, uh, in, in this endeavor that you're going to take on? Please do. Uh, we want a big smile for on all of our faces, and you're magnificent. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. So, fellas, I just want to say what a what a pleasure this has been. Um, you guys know how to worship better than many, many um, trained worship leaders. So thank you for your prayers. Thank you for um, your, your inclusion of silence. Thank you for just inviting me and being so welcoming. Um, I would be willing to come back any, any morning. So. Um, let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we thank you for the many gifts that you have provided for your church. I thank you for these men, for their commitment to you, for their commitment to their Bible study class, for their commitment to each other and their commitment to your church. May they teach members of the congregation, may they teach the staff that has been assembled to lead the congregation. And may the congregation and the staff be willing to listen to their wisdom. Holy God, we ask that you send us out into the world that so desperately needs your love. Help us to remember it is you whom we serve and equip us to do the work that you have called us to do. Amen. 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 Well, thank, thank you, Liz. Gracious words and your 